Hey folks, Mel the Trade Tutor back in the studio and back with a bit of a Let's Make special for you. Quite recently we completed our Let's Make Battlefield Basic series of tutorials covering all the essentials for your battlefields on World War II games. Yeah, your bunkers, your, your fire pit, anti-infantry, anti-tank defences and a whole load in between. I'll throw a link up if you'd like to check that out. But because we completed the series, I decided I would challenge myself to bring all those tutorials together, take the level of detailing up to the next step, and do a bit of an end of level boss. And that turned out to be an awesome six foot trench line, all modular. It got the trenches, the fire pits, the fire steps, fire ports, bunkers, saps, ladders, a bridge in it, and absolutely all sorts of other stuff. Now that project was done over five vlogs, yeah, with over three hours of footage. And if you're interested in those, you can check them out in the project playlist. I'll throw a link up to that as well. But this is the condensed version. I took those three hours and I condensed them down to the core information. I took out all the ums, the ahs, and I took out all the, the rambly bits and I gave just, I left just the important stuff you need to build the trenches and that's what this tutorial is. This is all those five vlogs compressed into one. I think it's an hour and 40 minute video. Yeah, to take you through the entire process on how I built those trenches. So, if you're interested in learning, jump on in. One quick thing before we do, please understand, yeah, I did have to compress it down. So there's a couple of sharp cuts. Apologies for that. If you'd like to see the full conversation, the vlogs are in the project playlist. But in the meantime, let's get cracked on with doing some building, eh? Come on, let me show you how I built my trenches. So the first stage of making our modular trench lines is obviously the bases. Now typically with the Let's Makes we've been using EPVC, expanded PVC foam board. In this case I've switched back to my old favourite, MDF. Now, MDF is a lot more sturdier than EPVC over longer pieces, which makes it perfect for this sort of work. Now, obviously, if you're working with MDF, remember, you're going to need power tools, you know, you're going to need watch with sharp blades, and you're going to need to sand. So watch those fingers and mask up when you sand, because MDF dust is not good for you guys. Now, a couple of quick tricks, or at least one good quick trick. These are my end pieces. Yeah, these are going to be the end of the watch with the trench lines. We need to do the middle bits, but how do you get two foot modular pieces? Okay, my cutting ain't that great, so I capitalize on the cutting service at B&Q. Now, when I get my boards from B&Q, I buy them as uh, eight foot by four foot, and I have them cut down into two foot by four foot strips, okay? It just makes it easier for me to transport them around and use them in the studio. And two foot or four foot is about the maximum length I'm gonna use. Now in this case, I'm benefiting in by being two foot, because what I've done is, as you can see, I've got my four foot by two foot piece here, yeah? And I've drawn my lines for my trench in the middle, yeah, out of the board, leaving me with two perfectly cut two foot ends. Yeah, just like that. Now I know these lines are absolutely perfect because they're machine cut. I know these. this is absolutely perfect because it's machine cut. It's capitalizing on pre-cuts, which is always a good idea when you're doing modular stuff. If you try and cut the line straight yourself, you might get it, it might go off a little bit, but it might cause you problems. This way, no problems with it. All fitting together absolutely beautifully. Now. That's how I'm doing the bases. My bases are two foot wide by 15 inches. Yeah, quite deep, and I'll explain why as we go on. But the next stage is I need to actually start carving out my foam for this. And for that, oh, I got this stuff. Yeah, okay. This is expanded polystyrene. Another, another B&Q purchase, Jab Bite Light. Yeah, it's their high quality uh, stuff. Now it's actually a hell of a lot denser, yeah, than the normal white expanded polystyrene. So for trench lines, which people might lean on, you know, we don't know what tanks are going on it, that sort of stuff, and I'm building it up. I want something a little bit sturdier, but I don't want to use HDF. Yeah, the high, not HDF, the high density foam. It's a bit of a waste if you're not carving details into it. Okay, that's what your HD foam is for, for your sculpting work. So, since it's all going to be covered, expanding foam it is, my next job, yeah, is I've got to cut this into lots of bits like that. Yeah, 
Right, let's crack on. So my first bit of cutting is done and I've cut out all my big sheets into the rough shapes. Yeah, that I need to do this. Now this has been quite simple. Yeah, just get a rough idea. And then I've used a, a hot knife to cut through this. You can work with this stuff with blades and with sandpaper and that sort of stuff. It is doable, but if you're gonna attempt a project like this, hot tools are a definite plus, you know what I mean? Now, as I said, I've done a rough cut, okay? But it's all about capitalizing on these edges. You'll keep hear, hearing me say that. So if I come along here, you'll notice that I've got the ends of the board here. And they are lovely, lovely smooth cuts. Yeah, and with a really nice corner piece there. But if I spin it round, okay, as you can see, we've got the more jaggedy bit. Yeah, and it's extending a little bit because I cut it with a little bit off so I can trim it down. My next job is I'm gonna get a standard wire cutter. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the boards, this two foot board and this two foot board, hold them in place, lined up at the other side, and that will give me a nice template that I can just take my wire cutter all the way down, yeah, and get a really nice clean cut, being at perfectly two foot. That's the plan anyway. It's always worked in the past, so it should do this time. Now, there are times when you're doing these sort of things where you edge them and you put side edges in. I'm not doing this on this project, but if you are doing that, then you need to factor in the width of the edge, one side, the other side, into the cutting of your polystyrene. Yeah, pretty typical. Yeah, it's six mil on each edge for a bit of six mil MDF or EPVC. So you need to take 12 mil off. So that's the job. Moving on, we need to, we've got our shapes sort of shaped, our right size, we need to make our trenches and start cutting them out. And so to start it off, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the corner pieces. Okay, now these are my corner pieces. Okay, they are trench enders. So I'll be able to put these either side of a two foot piece, a four foot piece, or a six foot piece. And what this will mean is, if, if I want my trenches not to go from table edge to table edge, but sort of go halfway along or something like that, or if I want it to be a bit of a bastion, I can end cap it, okay? Now, so I've got this piece, it's 50 inches along, yeah, and one foot, yeah, and it's uh, the, the table edge length. So it matches these pieces here and provides an end cap, okay? But of course, we need to make sure that our trenches are modular, that when we line everything up, it all fits and it all lines up. And to do that, I've got one of these. Now this is a bit of cardboard, okay? Just a bit of corrugated cardboard, but it's measured 15 inches across there. Okay, this point is nine inches, which means this is, this is three inches high in total, which means this is a one in three slope. Models will stand on this slope. Then you can see I've got my trench cut out, and then it goes to the end of the board. So if I come along, yeah, and I put that there, just like that, just like that, yeah, what it means is I can come along and I can easily mark out where I need to put my trenches with a blade. Yeah, and now, if I bring this up, yeah, you can see just about there, yeah, the trench lines. Okay, and that's what I'm going to use to make sure across all of these pieces they're uniform. So when I line them up, my trenches line up as well. Now this is the first template, okay? And what I'm going to do is, just to show you a rough idea of how it's going to work, I'm going to do this one. Yeah, I'll bring this back and then I'll show you how I'm going to transfer this template idea onto the larger pieces, okay? So working on the major two foot long trench sections and I'm glued the boards together. Now, if you come up, you can see my cut marks in there that I've done on these two loose boards. Now, once again, that's using this template. Yeah, and I've got a couple of pins in it so I can just place it on, pin it, mark out where they're going. And obviously I've done it on there. You know, I've just got these two sheets to cut out. Now, the important thing is when you do modular trenches is that even though I've done this big cardboard template over here to sort of lay out where I want my trench lines, the only thing that has to be perfect is the edges where they meet up. Everything in the middle is, could be higgledy-piggledy, okay? It doesn't really matter. 
So all I need to do is when I'm doing my precise cutting, okay, with my hot wire cutter, I just need to make sure that that little bit there So do the top bit first, get off, and then come in and do the bottom bit. And what I have is my cuts in perfectly. So if I grab that one, yeah, and I put those there, they line up perfectly. So everything in the middle, I can have a wiggle about with. Yeah, so my next job is to cut the sort of the ends so we can get wrong with <laughs> wiggling about in the middle. Right, I'll crack on. So we've cut out the main trenches, as you can see here, and you can see these nice deep cuts. Now, something I do want to point out straight from the off, yeah? You'll notice that as I've done these trench walls, they're actually sloped. So if I bring these up, you can see there's a slope to the wall. There's a couple of reasons for that. I've done trenches in the past where I've done the vertical walls, and what I've found is, one, yeah, because with your model bases, yeah, you often have arms, etc that extend beyond the base. If you do vertical walls, as you drop them in, you don't get enough room for the actual bases because their arms are sticking out. So by making them slightly sloped, it's better for placing the models. On top of that, if you go for vertical slopes, what you get this situation of is as you're moving your models, you have to go in with your hands in sort of a, a pincer motion to get it in. If you widen the top and bevel them out, making them slightly V-shaped, yeah, your hands fit much better for moving the models around. And finally, yeah, from experience, I, I found out that if you slightly slope the surfaces of your, your trench, it's easier to get things to adhere to them. So our, our actual watch, our trench walls, when we do our wood bits and that sort of stuff, if they're slightly sloped, it's a lot easier for me to glue those onto that side and also to get in with a paintbrush, yeah, down, especially down at the bottom because it's wider okay so quick tip on that one is if you're doing trench works don't do them completely vertical open them up a little yeah it's it's actually the reverse of what trenches were actually like a lot of the trenches had it were sort of sloped inwards towards the top yeah so you could sort of duck behind the trench and cover from artillery fire but in gameplay terms we need sort of function okay so we sort of adapt it we open up the top just to make it easier to make and easier to play with now, with this one that I've already started cutting, okay, they are separate sheets, which makes it a lot easier to cut. Now, these have been done with my hot wire cutter, freehand, and they're looking pretty good. Now, what we've got here is we've got the trench line, we've got a bit of a communications trench, and then this is going to be a bunker that's raised up so it can look over the slope. Yeah, moving over to this one. What we've got is we're going to have some sort of emplacement here. Okay, now this is going to be a two tier emplacement, which is why I need to do it in two stages essentially. But once again, we've got a communication trench and a path into it. Okay, so my next job is get this out and I just need to cut these out, cut these out and I'll bring them back once they're done. Right, to the gluing stage, and there's a couple of tips on this. One of the problems that you have when you're doing, what you call it, uh, large trench works, is that your scatter pieces tend to be long and not that thin. And anyone who's made terrain before will know that is, that is the, the sweet spot. Yeah, the perfect setup conditions for warping. So we've got to fight the warp, okay? I feel like a grey knight. Now, to do that, what I've done is I've done lots of little spots, okay? And let me explain this to you. Okay, first off, PVA is air drying. So if I do a big coat all the way over this, yeah, to glue it down, what will happen is that the edge will glue, okay? But then 
everything in, inside will stay wet because the edge will become airtight and no air will be able to get into the middle. By putting lots of little spots down, what it allows me to do is, is stick it down but still let air get through so all of this dries. So these spots will actually give better adhesion than if I went over the entire piece and gave it a good solid coat. Now, the other factor is warping is caused by PVA creep. Yeah, so if you have a long piece of PVA with, a uh, long piece of MDF with PVA all the way across it, as it dries, each little bit of that PVA slowly shrinks and across the entirety of it, yeah, it reduces down, causing the board to warp up. In this case, yeah, because there's no continuous lines, if these little bobs of PVA creep a little, it'll be absorbed by the foam. It won't translate into warping on the actual board. So if you want to fight warp and you fancy being a grey knight, use spots, not lines. Right, all my pieces are glued and solid now and we've reached the stage where all our functional cuts are done and it's time to move on to our sort of, our slopes, yeah, and start getting a bit arty with it. Now, to do this and to keep it modular, we're back with the template. I've used this template and what I've done is I've applied it to the side and then with a knife, I've just come along and marked it out. And what I'm left with is, do you see, let me go, you can see that line, can't you? Yeah, running from there, up there, yeah, and across. Now, that line is standardized, which means if I use this template on this side and on this bit, yeah, if I cut to that line, then I automatically know that when I put them together, they're gonna meet. Now, it's time to actually mark them all out, cut the lines. Now, to cut the lines, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be using a hot wire cutter, yeah? And I'm gonna be coming along and I'm gonna be cutting out sections bit by bit to sort of get it down. And I'm gonna leave probably about five mil above that line when I do my major hot wire cutting. That's because I can come in with sandpaper afterwards and start to shape it and take it down to that line. If I cut immediately to that line, yes, it will be correct, but it gives me no wiggle room to play with, yeah, in the shaping of, of the actual, of the hill. Okay, so that's my battle plan. Mark these up, okay, do my cuts, I'll come back when they're done. So I've got the basic shaping done, and if we come down to the desk, here you can see it in all its glory. Well, you can't even see it in all its glory because it's six foot long. But you can see that I've got the shape to it now. Now, I've done my one in three slope off my template, and I've done a rough cut, okay? But what that means is I know troops will stand on it. Yeah, they may slide down it at the minute because it's a little bit smooth, but once there's a texture on there, it will be absolutely fine. At the minute what's happening is because I've cut into these my, my template lines I have this situation where it goes up a little and then it's pretty much uniform i.e. it's nice long straight flat curves up to a sharp edge and I don't want that. What I want to do is I want to make it a little bit more undulating, a little bit more real. Okay, now to do that all I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with my hot wire cutter, I'm going to come in with my blade and I'm going to come in with sandpaper and I'm going to shape these up a bit. Okay, as long as I stay away from these lines at the edge, they will always be modular. So this is my safety area, about a centimetre in. Anything between a centimetre on one side and a centimetre on the other side, I can do whatever I want with. So the basic sanding and shaping is done and it's looking rather nice. Now if you look at it, you'll notice that I've changed it up quite significantly. We've dropped the trench height down a little. We've created a flat surface. 
across the ridge of the trench. This is so that when we get our models and they charge up the bank, which we know they can stand on, yeah, when they get to the top, they're sort of standing ahead and flat, rather than on, on a slope pointing up with a load of people shooting up from there. It's a little aesthetic, yeah, but it works, you know what I mean? Other things that I've done is I've made sure that there's various areas that I've pushed into and I've sloped in different ways, okay? And what I mean is the bank goes up a bit, down a bit. And what I didn't want was just a completely flat one level surface because it's not realistic, okay? And so it's, it's played out rather well. I've gone along, I've smoothed all my edges, made all this undulating, yeah? And I've come along here and I've sanded this piece in. But if I bring this off, yeah, you will notice yeah, look how scraggy. Now, when you sand polystyrene, whenever it gets thin, it will break. And that's just polystyrene. You've just got to accept that's what it does. Okay, but it's not a problem because I already expected that to happen. And I knew I'd be going in with a bit of filler and just coming along here and just smoothing it over and solving the problem. Which is the same on all the little areas where it's gone a little bit bobbly. We're going to put filler on it. It'll be fine. Okay, but... This would be the stage where I start to put filler on, okay? And I start filling in my gaps and that sort of stuff. I can't do that yet. The reason being is because I wanted to incorporate a bunker, yeah? And so if you see this piece over here, yeah? This piece has got our, our square for the bunker on it. I can't do my gap filling until the bunker's built. So that's my next job. Now, with regards to how I'm gonna build the bunker, dead simple, we're, we're in, this is the final of the Let's Makes. I'm gonna do the same foam bunker tutorial uh, method that I did for the tutorial. So I'll throw a link up to it, and if you're interested in that, you can go follow it there. But I'm gonna put that in there. Now, before I get cracked on with that, one of the other things that I've done is I've also done my final sort of shaping and sanding. Now this means coming along with your edge piece, yeah, and making sure everything lines up, everything fits snugly. And one of the problems when you do modular pieces is what you don't want is at some point on a join line, yeah, there'll be a little bump which forces your pieces apart. And so what I do is I get a T-square, Okay, and I know that this MDF cut here is perfectly fine, that's perfectly straight. It's just whether these are sticking out a bit. So all you've got to do is put it on, yeah, and slowly move it forward, yeah. As you move it forward, yeah, if at any point the T-square moves away from, the, away from the, the MDF, you've got a bump. And at that point, a little bit of sandpaper, come in, smooth it out, recheck it, okay, and away you go. Now there are tools, there are hot wire cutting tools and stuff like that, but scroll tables, but the vast majority of you guys won't have those. So this is how I did it before I got the scroll table. And to be truthful, as you can see, it's actually how I prefer doing it now, okay? One of my concerns with the sc scroll table is, once you get to this stage, if you make a mistake, it's really hard to fix. So having a little bit more control works well for me. So my next job is I need to put in a bunker and I need to put in a couple of fire steps. So I'll be back when they're done. See you in a sec. So guys, that's the bunker in and it's done exactly as I did it in the Let's Make video. And if you take a look, it's looking rather nice. Let me bring that up for you. Okay. Quite nice, isn't it? Spin it round. Yeah, now there's still gaps to be filled in that sort of stuff, which is where we're getting to now. So that's those gaps filled, and if I bring it up, yeah, you can see how I've just put slivers all the way around that bunker, and just trimmed them off. There's a little bit of PVA in there, so when it dries, it goes all set. And if I bring that up, you can see how I've made that disappear as well. But that's not the only little uh, sort of gaps and things you need to touch up when you're doing the sort of earthworks of your trenches. Yeah, there's also the issue of, do you remember at the start when I said, yeah, 
as you watch God put them together and as you stand it, all these little bits will break off. Now this isn't perfect and if you try and texture over this, this will show through. At the same time, these edges here, yeah, quite often you can get little bits breaking off as you're shaping them and doing all that sort of stuff. So even though I'm going to continue after this video with making more detail on the main boards, I need to sharpen up those edges. And for those, it's filler time. So if I bring this one across, yeah, you can see nice and clearly, yeah, how all I've done is I've just got a bit of filler and I've just smoothed all the way along there. Applied it into all the dips. Don't worry about getting it 100% right because if there's anything that shows through, it's just a clump foliage indicator for where you push your, put your bushes later, guys. Yeah, so don't worry about that. But get those all the way through there. And then at the same time, yeah, what I've done is I've given the edges a quick skim just to toughen them up. Now, we know we're going to be texturing this up anyway afterwards, so it's going to get tougher, but it's a bit like adding extra reinforcement. Now, this was done with dial filler. Yeah, just a matter of getting it out, smudging it down, and then get wet in your hand and smoothing it out. Yeah, now I can't do anything more on this until this is all firmed up, but I've got to do these. But that pretty much wraps up, okay, uh, the actual trench work. So, have a look at these picks. So guys, detailing up the trench and adding all the interesting bits that make trenches so awesome in wargaming. But before we actually tackle the trenches, there's something else I want to do. Now, if you come down here and have a look at this, you'll notice I've got some impressions in here. One of the things I want to do is you can't really have trenches without having some craters on them, yeah, from artillery strikes. Yeah, shell holes, shell scrapes, as we call them in the British Army, yeah? So to do that, what I'm doing is I'm using a heat gun. Now this is sort of, one, when you do this on terrain, it, it breaks up the large areas. It also gives a bit of cover and a little bit more stability to the models because you can angle the craters slightly. So if you come down here, you can see on these, I've started to put them in. And basically what I'm doing is, I'm using a heat gun to get a basic impression, a dip into the piece, and then I can go in with some sandpaper and I can go in with some Dad's modeling putty and create the rim. But before I can do that, I need to make the dips. So, to do the dips, yeah, come in close with your heat gun, yeah, switch it on, pull it away. It's about dipping it, yeah, so you maintain the control. And as you can see, I've got a lovely little dip there. Now, you're not going to get perfectly circular holes when you do this. You can use cardboard, cut a hole out of it, and then blow the air through that hole, and it kind of works, but it's always been a bit of a pain for me, and I just like just going for it. Okay, so, once again, get your, your, your heat gun, pick where you want your shell scrape, or your, your trench hole, give it a blast, Yeah, and then you get your hole. Next job is sanding it up. Now, I've got a little bit of sandpaper here, and my, my hole, when you use a heat gun, quite often it'll dip down around the edges and leave a little nipple raised in the middle. Yeah, come in with a bit of sandpaper, and just take that out. It will get a bit scrunchy, the reason being is because when you melt it, it gets hardened, okay, as the, as the plastic melts of the polystyrene. And then when you come in with the sandpaper, obviously you're breaking it off and it gets all a bit bobbly. Remember to watch out for the fumes, guys. But if I bring that up, yeah, there's the one where it first starts off and you can see that sort of little bump there. And then if we move across to there, you can see that I've got the dip in. And all that remains now is a little bit more sanding and then just shape that up. Okay, so that's my next job. What I want to do is, very quickly, put all my holes on, then what you call it, then a little bit of the sand, and then we'll come back and I'll show you the Daz modeling putty.
So working on the actual craters, but I took a moment out to actually work on the bunker. And if you take a look, you can see that the bunker is now all textured up. Now this was done just simply by a quick sand once it all glued and dried and once I took the pins out and then just a little bit of filler, a little bit of water, smear it all around, blend everything in. And it's come out looking just like concrete, which is perfect. And then obviously I've moved on to the craters, as you could see. So if we look at the craters, you can see that we've got our indents where we went in with the hot gun. Then I sanded it. Yeah. And we've been working on our sort of earth rings. Now the earth rings work in a couple of different ways. OK, they do a, f a few different things. One, they define the actual crater and make it look like a crater. But also because the lip comes up here, this bit is flat, this bit is flat, and that bit is cover. So I'm adding a little bit more dynamic gameplay into it and a bit of stability and a bit of functionality whilst making it look awesome. So when it comes to actually doing your rims, I need to take you through that. Slide that over there, pull this one here. Okay, so I've got my craters, yeah, I've sanded them, I've got my rough shape, but what I need to do is create the rim around them. And for that, I'm using Das Modeling Putty. And what I've done is I've rolled out myself a sausage. Yeah, and one quick trick. When you're putting Das onto anything, wet it. Das is really awful for connecting with, so sort of sticking to dry stuff. It just keeps falling off. But if you wet it first, and when you apply it down, which is what we're doing now, it will stick. Now the technique for applying this down is dead simple. What we're going to do is we're going to pinch it on first. And I'm trying to get just a, a rough circle. I'm more interested in actually getting it to adhere to it than the actual shape at this moment. Okay, so that's our pinching down. The next one is I'm going to smudge it out outwards. Now this isn't so much about blending it in with the piece or anything like that. It's more, once again, getting a better adherence with the actual polystyrene. So like that, come on. And there we go. Yeah, now that I've got it stuck down, yeah, I get to play a bit. And what I'm doing is basically, all I'm interested in doing is forming the inside circle. So I'm just sculpting it with my fingers. This is a bit tricky and it comes with practice to be truthful guys. A little bit of practice and you'll be doing it fine, absolutely fine. Yeah. Now, as you can see, I've got it roughly round. Next job, smooth it out. So I'm just gonna blend it outwards, just to take that lip off it so it's not so sharp. Yeah, I'm not really worried about what the outside shape of it is like and how sort of realistic it is. Yeah, because I'm going to be going over this with filler and texture in it anyway, so I can blend the outside in, the outside, yeah, when I do the filler. All I'm mainly interested in is this inside circle. Yeah, and if I do that, that's pretty good. No doubt I'll be touching it up because, you know, I like fiddling with things. But if I bring that up, yeah. There you are. Remember, when we come in with the filler, we'll be able to blend these edges in a bit more and they'll look a little bit more realistic. But we've made our earth embankment and that's the main thing. So I've got one more of these to finish off. And that one there and then they're all done. And we'll move on to doing the watch clip, the barbed wire. That's what we do next. Right, crack on. So my DAS craters are drying now and we're working on the stakes for the barbed wire. Barbed wire was typically held in place with wooden stakes or metal stakes so it didn't roll all over the place. So we're trying to replicate that. And to do that I'm using cocktail sticks. Okay, and I'm doing two rows of them. Now at the minute it looks rather spiky and pointy. That's because I'm going to leave these to completely dry and then I'm going to, I'm going to texture the surface before I come in with a pair of clippers and cut them down all to an equal height. It's a lot easier to make your stakes the same height 
if you do it after they're all glued in rather than pre-cutting and trying to push them into the polystyrene to all the same height okay so put them in first cut afterwards so how are we putting them in well, if i bring this one up yeah what you can see i may have to come bring this a little bit closer is yeah you can see these blue dots here this is marker pen and what i've done is i've simply gone across the entire piece and marked out where my stakes are going to go this is so that I can actually get a feel of how the barbed wire flows across all the pieces because it's a modular piece so it needs to match up at the edges okay next off a couple of blobs of, of PVA on them and then finally I've dropped in my watch clip my cocktail sticks and dropping in the cocktail sticks it is as simple as picking spot pushing it down yeah pulling it back up again to get PVA on the stake and then putting it back down again that's all there is to it so I'm going to do the last of these few on here that's done and then we're going to move on to fire steps So working on the fire steps for the trenches, and if you're not aware of what a fire step is, a fire step is essentially a ledge, okay? And as you can see, I've added this sort of one inch ledge on, and the idea being that when your troops are in the trench itself, they're protected, yeah, from incoming fire. Yeah, at least horizontal, you know, the, the bomb's coming down here, <laughs> tough luck. Yeah. Did you know that trenches were actually sloped like that, so you could duck behind them to hide from artillery and stuff like that? little trick for you but don't do that for your model yeah it'll be a right pain in the backside to make trust me yeah slope your slope them like that for your model okay but anyway the idea behind a fire step was that you could walk around here perfectly safely yeah having your brew and your cigarette and that sort of stuff and when the enemy was charging towards you you could step up to your fire step yeah and shoot them from cover and then when you shot them, you can step back down again. And that's the idea behind a fire step. And it, the, the difference, I suppose, would be like, oh, you're down, you can't be shot at, or you're in cover, yeah, and you can shoot at. I'll probably figure out some mechanics, so yeah, to go with the games to, to represent one or the other. You know what I mean? Which, which position you're in. But that's game mechanics, isn't it? But you're interested in how I'm actually doing the fire step, aren't you? All right, come on down. Okay, so if I bring this one up, you can see yeah that what i've essentially got is a one inch strip all the way across the front of the trench and i've duplicated this on this piece over here on this piece over here and we've just got this last one over here to do which i can use to show you how i'm doing it right so that's the problem with big pieces you need to keep moving them around now very simply yeah i have cut a one inch batten from my off cuts, okay? One inch long, well, one inch wide, one inch high, because it's the, the height of the polystyrene. Yeah, and then on this side, what I've done is I've beveled it. Okay, now the bevel is because these are sloped. So if I put it completely flat, it, they would stand away from the wall at the top of them. So by beveling it, I can get in snug. Now, to actually put it in and shape it round, because obviously this is straight, this is curved. No, Mel didn't make a mistake, Mel's got a fix. Okay, dead simple. Yeah, you're gonna break it. Yeah, and all I'm doing is just coming along and I'm not breaking it completely, I'm just snapping it. <coughs> oh, pardon me, like that. But what that allowed me to do is come in here and place it straight off against there. Yeah, and if I bring that round, you can see by breaking it, yeah, I've got it to go round the corner. Now, next job. Yeah, a bit of glue, glue along there, that's for the bottom. And then if we go for here, glue along here. Yeah, specifically this top edge of the bevel. Okay, because that's what's gonna sit against the wall. The bottom might sit away from it. Yeah, so glue across the top of your bevel. Yeah, and then simply come in, pick where you're gonna put it. Yeah, you might need to break it a couple bit more. To oh, I broke it, there you go, just like that. Now I'm going to put it there, push it in there. Now we've got a bit of a crater there, so we can have a bit of a collapse. Don't worry, I'll sort that. Yeah, but I'm going to push them in there. Next job, trim off the ends. So blade, 
Watch your fingers. I'll do a quick job here because I can do a sharper job off camera. Actually, that's quite a good job. Uh, and then if I spin this one round, I'll clean that up off camera as well. But if I bring that round like that, so you can see, yeah, as you can see, I've got my fire step in there. Yeah, and it is as simple as that. I don't need to worry about these cracks and this sort of stuff because this is all going to get covered over. Yeah, we're going to have uh, various sort of sheet metal and, and wooden planks and stuff like that. It's just the substructure. Yeah, but I need to get it in and I need to get it set. Now that is the last of the fire steps to go in. Yeah, all the rest of them are done. So my next job is I need to start working on the top of the trenches, okay? Because it wouldn't just be a lip and then flat. Quite often you'd have sandbags, you'd have earth built up, you'd have fire ports and vision ports and sniper ports and all sorts of ports and then bottles of ports in the officer's mess, eh? What oh brother? Bloody Ruperts. Right, uh, I'm gonna crack on now. That, well, I'm gonna quickly pin this so it doesn't move, yeah? So it stays nice and stable for me. Yeah, and then what you call it, we'll come back once I've started decorating the top of the trenches and making it a little bit more interesting. Yeah, crack on. So I'm working on the earth rampart, that's sort of part of the defensive part of the trenches. The idea being that when I looked at sort of images of trenches, what you got was you got the trench wall with the fire step and then it sort of sloped out and then goes up a bit and down a bit. So basically when the soldiers are in the trenches and they're on the, on the fire step, they can stand, they can rest on the earth embankment and then the rifles can just go over like a little earth lip and a little earth earth ramp. On top of that, I spotted that there were quite a few, what you call it, sort of places where they built the earth up, put a plank across it, load of sandbags to make like a shooting port. And so what I've done is I've done this. Yeah. And you can see my shooting ports there with the planks on top. They've still got to be dressed with uh, sandbags. Yeah, but that's a, a stage later, yeah? But in the minute, I'm just getting the basic substructure in for them. So you can see that I'll, basically I've put all the, what do you call it, the DAS modeling putty down, and I've, I've basically these are just lollipop sticks with the ends cut off. And if I bring this one off, yeah, just to show you how I've done it on here, yeah, it's a bit easier to hold. It is exactly the same technique as I used on the craters. Wet it first, roll it, place it down, smooth it out, yeah, in the case of these, I blobbed it up, shaped them roughly, yeah, let them stick down, and then I added the watcher of the plank. Now, the last thing I need to do is I need to go along with a little bit of PVA and just rub a little bit of PVA either side of there. The reason being is, as does dries, it's not a glue, it's a clay, okay? And so it won't actually stick to the actual wooden planks, they'll become loose again. Yeah, especially because it shrinks a little, Daz does. Yeah, because as the moisture disappears from the Daz clay, it shrinks down, its volume reduces. And that means all these watch your little planks are gonna become loose. So I'm just gonna get a little blob, PVA, either side, pull that over, and as it shrinks, that'll hold it all in place. So that's the next job. Now work continues on shaping up the trenches. And if we come down to our pieces, what I can do is I can bring this up and I can show you. Yeah, I've been working on shaping the trench lines ready for us to sort of put in all our detail and all that sort of stuff because before it was pretty standardized. So what have I do in Bosicle? Well, dead simple. First off, the ground, we're sanding that, we're sanding the fire step, we're coming into this ridge here, which was quite sharp, we're sanding that down to make it a little bit more undulated, a little bit more real, because it wouldn't have been a sharp angled step of earth. It would have got broken down as they were leaning, putting their guns over and that sort of stuff. Same time, we're shaping up the back pieces. And all of this is being done just quite simply a little bit of sandpaper. It is just a matter of coming along and giving it a little shape. 
above all, what I'm trying to do is just break up all those straight lines, those uh, straight flat bits at the bottom of the trench. This is one of the reasons why we built uh, our polystyrene three layers high and only cut the trenches two layers down. So we'd have a layer to play with and shape. It just helps it make it all look more real. So I'm gonna finish these pieces. I'll show you some pictures. So guys, we've skipped ahead in the build and this, right, so why have we skipped ahead? Well, dead simple, yeah, Muppet Boy Mel here didn't realize that the memory card in that camera had filled up, okay? And so when I was sort of explaining what I was doing and that sort of stuff, I thought I was recording the good, nice close-up footage. Uh, okay, now luckily, okay, it was only a simple thing that I was sort of explaining. So I can easily bring you up to speed and explain it anyway. Okay, so if we come down to the bench, yeah, it's looking a bit different, isn't it? Very white. Don't panic, it's actually just a minor stage. So let me bring you up to speed. So if we look at the actual pieces, one of the things that we've done at the end of the, the sort of last bit of footage I have had on this video, was we've gone in our, with our sandpaper and we'd shaped our fire step, we'd undulated our terrain, yeah, i.e. shaping all this and get ridding, getting rid of that rigid line that we had that looked far too unnatural, yeah? And it looks a lot more natural now. If I grab this piece and bring it up, yeah, you can see where, by going in and shaping it and putting these little dents in here, it just makes it look so much more realistic, guys. Okay, now I have got the fire step the whole way along it, yeah? And I was debating whether to take chunks of that out, but yeah, I wanna keep this as functional as possible and if you don't want such a longer fire step, then just don't cut them as long. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's nothing for me to really gain by cutting them out at this stage. So I'm not gonna worry about it. Now, the other thing that I did was, I've cut all my cocktail sticks down to the right size. And the other thing was, with regards to the undul undulation, if you look in places like here, you can see these blobs of daz. It wasn't just about shaping it down. After I'd sanded all the pieces down and got the dips in, I wanted a few rises. And so what I did was, dead simple, little balls of daz, push them a little bit flat, wet the polystyrene, place the daz balls on top, okay? And then just smooth them out with a wet hand. And what I was left with was these bumps. And these are just little ones all over the place. Now, they may not seem like much, but just a little bit of undulation on a train makes it so much different than if it was just a flat surface, yeah? It all adds to that sort of realism, okay, that we're trying to go for. And then there hears me saying, well, you know, five steps, you're functional, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I wanted to break up that flat surface. Now, after the dance was put on, all I did was went in with some filler. I rebuilt up all the edges of the craters so they weren't so pronounced. And I think I've got a little bit of work still to do on that one and a couple of others. That's looking a little bit sharp. And the other thing was with a wet hand and lots of water, I just rubbed filler all over it. Now, this isn't about texturing it. Okay, we've still got to texture it. This is about firming it up. Yeah, if you rub filler over polystyrene, it firms it up really well, okay? And the other benefit of rubbing filler all over polystyrene is that you can then use hot glue and super glue and glue things to the polystyrene because once it's got a coat of filler on, yeah, it won't retreat back away from the polystyrene with the heat or with the super glue, okay? so. That's really important because the next stage that I'm gonna be working on after I've done a, a couple of little touch-ups on these craters is we're gonna start de detailing up the actual trench walls. So, yeah. Here's some pics of where it is right now and I'll bring it back once I've got stuck into the trench walls. See you in a sec, guys.
So I'm working on detailing up the trench walls. And for the first part of this, I'm going with corrugated cardboard. Now this is simple craft cardboard that you can buy that's flat on one side and corrugated on the other side. And it comes in these A4 sheets. And it's just a simple matter of cutting them down to the right size, yeah, applying PVA glue and pinning them in. I did mention previously that I might, I was going to use hot glue, but I actually sat down and thought, well, I'm going to have to pin the top and the bottom anyway. Hot glue is just an additional step, so I'll skip that and just stick with the PVA. Yeah, I love PVA, don't I? Yeah, but if I bring it up, you can see that we've got all the various panels cut, and they're all different sizes because... I like to break up uniformity. It makes it look a little bit more interesting and a little bit more real. And if I spin this round, you can see this fire pit here. Now, in the fire pit, I've changed the orientation of the corrugated bits. Yeah, this is because it's a lot easier to actually go round curves. And I'm gonna replicate this on the rest of this side as well. Now, that's for the corrugated card. I do intend to do boarding and that sort of stuff, but, We'll look at that in the next section. In the meantime, I'll get cracked on with getting this corrugated card on. Right, I'm down here, working on the trenches. Come on down. All right then, so what we got? Well, as you can see, yeah, I'm starting to put my, my, my corrugated cardboard's all in and it's looking really nice. I'm starting to put my stakes in. Now, I've started off with the simple ones at the front. I'm going for cocktail sticks on this, yeah, because I don't want to take up too much room on the fire step with large support beams, that sort of stuff. So cocktail sticks work really well because they actually fit into the grooves of the uh, corrugated cardboard. Now, the way I'm doing this is dead simple. I've just done these in one quick row, but yeah, I'm coming along. I am putting a blob of PVA roughly where I want the steak. And I'm putting it on the top of the cardboard, just like that, yeah? I'm then getting my cocktail stick, okay? Placing it in, pushing it down, giving it a little twist so the PVA goes all the way around, and then pushing it in, okay? And what that means is, it, you know, I've got a nice blob at the bottom so it'll make sure it sticks. And I've got PVA all the way up, which means it will stick securely. And when it's dried, I can come along with my clippers and just clip them down. Now, obviously this is for the front step. When it comes to the back step, I'm actually using balsa wood. Okay, so if you come down here again, I'll show you these. Yeah, now these are my balsa wood beams, and all I've done is I've just basically got 5mm balsa wood uh, strips, give them a quick brush with a wire brush to get a bit of texture on, and what's going to happen is these are going to come in and we put on all the larger points. Now the benefit of using balsa is obviously you can you can shave it and you can sh you know do all the wonderful things you can normally do with it, but balsa wood is, is soft enough that I can put pins through it. So I can put my PVA down and I can literally pin it to the trench wall until the PVA grips. Right, so the fire step. Now, for the fire step, what I'm using is I'm using balsa wood. And what I've got is, I've got a sheet of balsa wood here, okay? And all I've done is, with my wire brush, I've scored it to get a bit of texture to it. So it looks a little bit more like wood. After that, I've cut it into strips. And then after that, I've cut it into little planks. And all I'm doing is going along, and I'm just pushing these in. Now, each of these planks is three quarters of an inch long, okay? Which is sort of the minimum you need to do a, what you call it, for a, a one inch base to stand on it steadily, okay? Now, I need to get this finished because I can't do the rest of the texturing until the fire steps in and everything else is glued down completely. Thank you. 
Right, as you can see, yeah, there's a bit of blue there. Now what we've done is, I've gone in with my long blade, I've removed the fire step, sanded it down, yeah, just to get it sort of level. And then I've gone in and I've put a full length piece of our corrugated card in, and a couple of wooden stakes. We used exactly the same techniques as we did on the trench wall, okay? So there's nothing really to show you. Other than perhaps a little bit of, what you call it, a little bit of, let me bring that up. Yeah, so you can see, you can see I put the corrugated cardboard on the sides as well, just to cover up the sides. Now, I've not just only done that. Uh, which one? This one. Okay, what else have I got to do? Well, straight off, you can see a walking great hole in that base, and it's quite pronounced. Okay, this is for the muddy puddles. Now, I don't expect the puddle to be this deep. I'm going to go in and I need to relayer it with some DAS modeling putty and I've got to put some texturing on it afterwards anyway. Yeah, so I needed it quite deep. So I dug it out with some simple, what you call it, some simple 60 grit paper. Now, on top of that, you can see we've got another one of our sections here. And these are going to be for the ladders for going over the top. Yeah, but over here, yeah, you'll see we've got a slightly larger section. Now in this case, I've come in, I've cut it out, and then I've gone in with my blade and I've essentially cut straight lines. I've then used the, the tip of a ruler and dug it out. That's gonna be a sap. Now if you don't know what a sap is, a sap is an underground tunnel that leads to a forward point. Now it could be an observation point, it could be a, a dummy bunker or something like that, but basically they were quite common in the trenches. So it sort of occurred to me that, well, it's quite possible, you know, not only to sort of like go to the observation point via the sap, but if the enemy discovers their observation point, they could come in via the sap. So they're alternative entries onto the board, you know, so my troops have broken through here. So I've got one on here and one on one of the curved bits over here. And the idea being is depending on how they're laid out modularly, either they'll be at the end of the board or there'll be one on the edge and one roughly center. Yeah, so there's a bit of play functionality wise there. Final thing is, sorry for the sniffles. Yeah, you can see I've just cut out a little wedge from either side of there, and that's where our, our sort of platform's gonna go across our bridge. Okay, so my next job is, uh, I need to prepare, what you call it, my saps. Yeah, so I'll come back once I've got my saps done. Right, that's most of the construction elements of the changes I wanted to do done. If you come on down, let me show you. So obviously, yeah, we've done our ports for our ladders, which are there using exactly the same techniques. If I bring it across, yeah, you can see our sap there. And it is hollow, or it goes in about an inch. Yeah, and I'll be able to cover that up and that sort of stuff, but that's the entrance to our underground tunnel. Now on top of that, our request went out for a bridge, so if I can get it on the camera right, there you go, there's your bridge. Now all of these things have been put in, but they need blending in with the rest of the scenery, the bridge, the saps, the flooring as well, and that means DAS modeling putty, that's my plan. But I can't use that until my PVA is dry, because what I don't want to do is go in with a bit of water and DAS and start messing around, start moving things. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that to dry, and then when it's dry, we'll DAS it up, and then we're onto the texturing. So, feeling a bit better back in the studio and everything is dry now. So, if you'd like to join me at the desk, yeah, as you can see, all our bits are on. And I'm only going to show you this one because it's duplicated on the others. So, we'll just go through this one. Right, uh, so, we've got our, what our bridge here. That's gone down in firm. Yeah, we've got our ladder spots and we've got our saps. Now, you will notice that if I bring them up, yeah, that, we've got a few holes here, we've got a hole here, we've got a gap here. These need to be filled, okay? But it's not just them. We've also got gaps along here with our bridges. We're gonna have gaps along here. 
okay, in the sort of where the uh, corrugated iron goes up, but the, the polystyrene dips down behind it. And so we need to fill those. Now, I'm not gonna use filler, because one, my filler's getting low, and two, I need to do something, I need something a bit bulkier. Filler can be a bit sloppy at these sort of jobs. Yeah, so, my product of choice is the old Daz again. So all the DAS is in and the gaps are filled. And if you come down, yeah, you can see on here that I filled in all these gaps. Yeah, I filled in our big trench. That's still wet. Now, to be truthful, I really should wait until it's dry before I continue, but I know I'm gonna be fine from experience, so I'm just gonna crack on. Yeah, on top of that, we've blended in the bridge, blended in all these gaps. Yeah, I missed that one. I'll have to do that one, right? Uh, I'll do that now. There we go, all fixed. Only took a second. Right, my next job is I need to start doing the planking. Now I have been thinking, I don't want to plank it all the way up or all the way along. It'll be a long job and it doesn't really need it. Okay, what we do need though, is where we've got these impressions that we've put in, we do need to put plank in there because that's where we're gonna put our water. And so what I've got over here is my standard strips of uh, balsa wood. I've gone over them with a wire brush to get some texture on them, and then I've cut them out, and we've basically got all of those. Now I'm gonna use these to lay across, yeah, the trench line, i.e. I'm gonna go the same sort of orientation as I've gone with the fire step. It would be easier to do them lengthways, to be perfectly honest, but, what I want to do and try and achieve with this, yeah, they really need to go perpendicular to the trench wall. And on top of that, that's how they were done in the trenches. Yeah, I think. <laughs> I've seen photos and that's how they were done. Now, it's not just a matter of gluing some boards down. I want to start texturing it up as well. And so with that in mind, yeah, it's recipe time. We're going to make some terrain group gloop. So what I've got here is I've got some filler. It's a spare tub. I just need to use it, and I might as well use it on this. I've got some grit, very fine, sharp sand, PVA, and some paint. And I'm just going to mix these together, yeah, to make a bit of a slurry that I can use to put down in the corners and around places and all that sort of stuff. So is there much in here? Ooh, there's not much in there, is there? We should be okay, but if I have any problems, I've got some Artex down there I wanted to mess around with, so I can use that as well. So let's get this in there. So that's all our filler in. It's a little bit dried out, but we should be fine. Yeah, let's throw a bit of PVA in there. Take the lid off. Good squirt. PVA just helps it all bond together. Now, we need to thin it down a bit. Yeah, and so we're onto the paint. Yeah, and the trick is to thin it down enough that when you add the grit, it thickens up but still stay, stays a slurry. So, grab the paint. One, two, two should be enough. And then what I've got to start to do is I've got to mix all this in and see if I can get a smooth paste out of it. So, I'll see you in a sec, guys. Right, our slurry is pretty much, well, there you go. Yeah, it's a little bit bitty, but that'll be perfectly fine. Now, the next job is grit. Now, you don't need that much grit in it, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, I normally find enough to, to sort of coat the top is enough to do what you need to do for this sort of volume. Yeah, when it comes to the grit, always work on the basis of add a little, see how it goes, see if you need to add more. Yeah, it's a lot easier to add more grit than it is to take it away. In fact, you bloody can't take it away. Right, let's put a bit more in, and I think that'll be about it. And so there we are, and that's our consistency, yeah? If I bring the spoon up, you can see the texture on it. Yeah, if I show you in there, perfect, absolutely perfect. Now the next job that we need to do is get prepped to actually lay it down, so give me a second. All cleaned up and applying now. So I've got my slurry, yeah, I've got a plastic spatula. 
and I've got a hog's hair brush. And with this, this is what I'm doing. Okay, I'm pasting my slurry on and it is going down and I'm just basically manipulating it and pushing it into the corners. I'm also putting it over the actual, uh, what do you call it, the, the craters. Yeah, it's important when you do this that after you've brushed it, you do go in and give it a bit of a stipple. Otherwise, you're gonna have stroke marks, which will be dead obvious. For the sandbags, I'm going to be using Daz as usual. Yeah, I've got some tape on my desk. I've got two lines there that are five millimeters apart. I've got two lines there that are eight millimeters apart and they're divided up into 50 millimeter sections. And so what we're going to do is roll this out until it's five mil. Once we've got our five mil, we place it on our eight mil and then just press it down until it fills those eight mil spots. And then we divide it up at the 50 mil di divides. And finally, we're left with that, which all we do is just tap in the edges to make it a nice round sandbag. Well, a little bit more sandbag-like. Right. Only got 300 or so of these to do. Crack on. So going through the long process of sandbagging it up, and if you take a look, it's looking rather nice. Yeah, now you can see straight away what I'm doing with the sandbags here is I'm starting off with a simple row that goes all the way along. Yeah, if I spin it round to this side, yeah, you can see where I've started to sort of offset the sandbags, like they've fallen off. It, it helps break it up and make it look a little bit more, more realistic. Now, if I move it across a little bit further, you can see where we've got these piles of sandbags. Yeah, now those piles are for the vision ports. Yeah, it may be a little bit excessive on the sandbags, not quite sure yet, but I quite like the look of it. And I've duplicated it on both sides. Yeah, so if I bring that down, it's all right. I'm trying not knacking me sandbags while I do it. Yeah, I've got them on both sides. So they're like sandbaggy mounds, yeah, with the planks and the, the sandbags across the top. Now I've done all of this, yeah. All I need to do is I need to come in and I just need to do this back row here and a couple of little odds and sods on it. And then at that point, all the sandbagging will be done, okay, which is, almost pretty much finishes this project off. Now to lay the sandbags down, it's dead simple. All I'm doing is I'm putting a blob of PVA down and then I'm putting the sandbags on top. So along the, the long line, I did a long line of PVA and just repetitively place them down. Then after that, I'm going in and just putting little various blobs down and popping them on. So yeah, if I was to give you a quick example, yeah, it is just a simple matter of coming in, yeah, putting a bit of PVA down, getting you a couple of sandbags, yeah, it's always best to sort of align them sort of off each other. Yeah, so don't make them too regular. Yes, they would have been regular when they were built, but they would have been shelled, they would have got moved and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and to be truthful, the, the soldiers aren't gonna climb out of the trenches to reorganize the sandbags at the top of the firing line. They're gonna do the best they can from cover and leave the rest. So two have gone down, and then if I wanna place on top, I need to put a bit of PVA on top, to drop another sandbag on. Yeah. So once all these are done, okay, uh, the only thing I'll need to do then is to start putting the ladders on. Now there's a few places that need ladders to get about. And for that, what we've got is dead simple, uh, two barbecue skewers. Yeah, and then what we've done is we've split coffee stirrers in half and used those for the slats. And all we're gonna do is trim them to the right length and glue them in place. Once everything is in place, yeah, all I'll do then is with the last of our textured mud, just blend some of the edges in so everything doesn't look like it's sitting on top of the mud rather that 
you know, it's sitting in the mud. So got a little bit of that left. We'll use that just to blend a couple of edges. Don't need to do it all, just a little. Yeah, and that should wrap it up. So got all those little jobs done and we're getting almost ready to start painting. Now come on down and I'll show you what I've actually done. Now if you can see on this main piece, yeah, I put in a row of sandbags in there. So we took off all the bits, re-put down the clay, yeah, uh, retextured it and laid in some sandbags. Now on top of that, you'll notice if I bring this up, yeah, that the sandbags are looking decidedly more dirty. This is because after it actually they'd all dried and set in place, I went back with my mud mix and basically lathered it around the edges of the sandbags and smeared it over and rubbed my hand over it just to dirty them up and blend them in. Before that, they were, they were looking like they were sitting on top of the ground and now they look far more like they're part of it. You know what I mean? And it, it just looks better. Now, it wasn't just the sandbags and refixing that bit. I also started to add a couple of little bits on. So things like barrels and all sorts of little bits all over the place. There's binoculars on it. I've still got to put a helmet on a stick on it. Yeah, but we're getting there. Now we've reached to the stage where we are almost ready to paint. I know, I know, yeah. All I need to do now is very quickly, I just want to have a look at, quick look at these sides and give them a quick run over with a little bit of sandpaper just to smooth out any sort of bits that stick out a little. That's stopping them from coming together really neat. Yeah, so quick run over the edges with sandpaper and then once that's done, I get ready to start prepping with the painting. Now this will start, yeah, by using a simple black emulsion, a latex plate paint in the US. And I'm just gonna paint round the sides, okay, and just blacken those up, ready for us to tackle the earth. I always do that first for some reason. I always end up neating it up at the end, but I like putting the base coat down first before I actually paint the top surface. Don't know why, it's just me, but that's what I need to do. So, crack on. Time to start painting it up. Now, when we've done our traditional let's makes, we've done them with this sort of, what is it? It's a, a Java Breen Brown, yeah, from Wilco's Statements range. Okay, and we've used this color for all the let's makes for the Battlefield Basics. It's a bit of a standard color, but it is in no way realistic. Now, part of the uh, idea behind these Battlefield bosses at the end of the series is that I step it up and I show you where you can take the let's makes if you put a little bit more effort in. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make the ground a little bit more realistic. So I've got two colors here. I've got a brown and I've got a gray. Now you may say brown for the ground, gray for the bunker. No, gray to go in the brown to make it look more realistic. This is called desaturation. So my base coat has gone down and it is a lovely dark brown. 
Okay, it's a desaturated brown. On top of that, I've also done the bunker. Now, before I can actually do more on the earth tones, yeah, because I've got to do the man-made details. This is because they would have had a set colour and then they would have got muddied up. Okay, so before I can tackle the earth, I've got to do things like the trench walls, all the wood, and the bunker. Now, for the bunker, I'm going to use my standard sort of stippling technique with greys and a little bit of yellow in there. If you haven't seen that, uh, there's a video in the Urban Techniques playlist. With, with regards to the wood, uh, I'm going to go for a brown, yeah, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a little bit of grey in there, desaturate it down a bit, get a little bit more realistic, and then we're going to let the washes do the work. For the actual, watch work, for the actual metallic bits on the bunker, yeah, the actual corrugated iron, uh, all the reference photos I've seen, this is pretty much galvanised, yeah, and it was basically grey, you know what I mean? So, rather than go for metallic, yeah, I'm going for a grey. I'm going to stip it up and let the washes do the work on that. So that's the next job before I can get the rest of the earth tones down. So, long day of painting ahead. Right, let's crack on. You'll see it through pictures. Okay, so here we have our piece. Well, we've got all the pieces, but I can show you what I've done on this piece. So straight off, yeah, we've gone in and I went in with my light grey, yeah, and I did all the corrugated iron, yeah, which has given it a really nice sort of dirty galvanised look. I didn't want it metallic. Moving on from that, I then went in and I came in with a really desaturated brown, yeah, brown mixed with a grey, and I used that for sort of my wood tones, yeah, along all the wooden platforms, the bridges, down here. Next job, come back in with the base colour and just start blending in the edges, yeah, so just along all the little join lines where there was lots of oil, where there's lots of earth falling down, okay, and I got all those done, and then the next stage after all they were done, okay, and it was looking rather nice, was to start the sandbags, now obviously you can see the sandbags and if I hold them up they're looking pretty bright, don't worry about this yet, yeah, I've got to highlight them, then we're going to wash them all down when we apply the washes, but I want a good mustard base coat to my, my sandbags, I quite like that colour, yeah. I'm not sure if it's the most realistic colour to be perfectly honest, sandbags were never mustard, mustard when I, I used to fill them, but it does work as a good base once you sort of highlight and wash it down, they do look really nice, okay. And that's where we are right now. now all that's left for me to do right now is, I want to tackle stippling up this bunker. Now, but stippling up the bunker, I'm going to use my, what do you call it, my realistic concrete technique. Now that's just dead simple. That's using greys with a tiny touch of yellow. Yellow moves the grey, it's a bit, yellow is a little bit like adding brown to it. It moves the grey off that monotone sort of path. Yeah, and it moves it into something a little bit more realistic. And all I'm going to do is do my base grey, put a little bit of yellow into it, yeah, start stippling it up and then slowly add a little bit more lighter grey. And what that will do is it will bring it up and it will make, because of the stippling, it will make it look lovely. So I'm probably going to show you that through photographs once again, okay? And then once that's done, these will be dry enough to give them a dry brush so I'll throw some photos up for that and it'll be time to tackle the earth.
Okay, now, there is, we are pretty much ready, okay, to start flocking it, except for one last thing, which is the wash. So, if you come down, yeah, what I've got here is, I've got a very, 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 very dark brown, okay? Now, that very, very, very dark brown is my standard brown that all of this has been done in, okay, with the different tones, and just some black. So, I've just darkened it. Okay, now I'm going to use this as my wash just to blend in, break up a few last elements. So we're going to do the sandbags, we're going to do these uh, trench walls here, we're going to do the trench floor, okay, and then I'm going to do the actual watchword bunker. And I'm going to be a little bit more specific, throw a bit extra dark tones, a bit of streaking on that. I've covered that in a previous video, I'll sh throw a link up on the actual techniques. Yeah, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to combine that weathering to make that specific building pop. Yeah, but generally, the wash is to tone down the brightness of the sandbags because they'd be dirty. They wouldn't be this clean. And also to darken down the trench itself because that's the muddy, damp, wet area. So guys, that's all the washing done. And if you come down to the table, you can see on my trench system where the washing has gone in. Obviously I've done a little bit on the bunker and that sort of stuff, but the main washing has been done in the actual trench itself. If I very quickly grab this bit, you can see how dark I've got it in there. On top of that, I've done along those lines, the blending lines there and the blending lines on this side and a bit of spot washing on the actual watch clip on the sandbags to dirty them up. And what this has done is it's given that impression of dampness, okay, and depth to the trench. Now, as I said before, technically, because they're on a hillside, they wouldn't be that damp, but you guys asked for it, so. There we are. Same time, yeah, I've gone over all my woodwork, given that a wash, and that's all about blending and breaking things up. Lots of, I, I first went in with a light brown wash, and then I went in with a dark one specifically in recesses and on the floors and in the edges. The reason for that is the lots of different tones break it all up and make it look more realistic. So if you come along, you can see how I've used the dark wash along here, into this crevice, into this crevice along here, into this crevice, there, there underneath the actual sandbag, sort of vi viewport, where I think it would be damp. I haven't done the, what you call it, the, the craters yet. They, they're yet to do. But what I have done, as you can see, is I've come in and I've glued down uh, the start of the barbed wire. Now I am gonna glue that, that down more when I go in with the PVA and do the flocking and that sort of stuff. But I didn't wanna be fiddling around with the barbed wire whilst the glue was wet, whilst I was waiting to get flock on it. So I just, a couple of spots just to get the barbed wire in place, yeah, then apply the PVA. And I am going to add more barbed wire onto this once the PVA is on, but I needed to put at least two strands on, yeah. So that's all my washing done, okay. Uh, that's all my barbed wire done, and we are actually at the stage of flocking it. Okay, so I need to get set up for flocking. I think the best thing that I can do is, I'll show you some pics and I'll come back when we're ready to flock it. Right, got myself set up and we are ready for flocking. Okay, but before we get into flocking, there's a little bit of a challenge that we need to talk about. Now, obviously there's flocking and there's flocking modular pieces. Much like with building it uh, and painting it and doing all those sort of things, we need to consider the modularity. Okay, and what I mean by that is, what we need to do is if we're using different shades of flock to represent different sort of grass types, we need to make sure that when we put the, these pieces together in different orders, yeah, the flock lines up. And there's a simple way of doing that. Okay, now if you come down, what you can see is I've got my two end pieces here. Now this is important because technically, one represents a left hand, end, i.e. on the larger pieces, all the lefts will line up to this, and 
this will line up for the right hand side. So technically, if I do this one piece and I keep these together, yeah, I can make sure that my different gra grass blends, so I've got my dark, mid, and a little bit of light tone, my different glass, grass, glass, gra grass blends, struggling today, grass blends will go down on this piece and they, I'll be able to match that they're in the right place. So when I come to do the larger pieces, I'll be able to separate these two end bits, put them either side of the piece, separated by perhaps a centimetre, okay, so they're not actually touching, but I'll be able to see what sort of grass tones I need up the slope. Now when it comes to actually grassing this up, we're gonna go for, I'm thinking it's sort of light, a bit of dark tones on here, mid-tone around here, a little bit of light tone. I want this mainly as mud. Now when we get to the back, I don't really wanna grass these up. I wanna give the impression of grass on the right hand edge. So essentially what we've got is we've got the trench works and the mud either side of it, but there is grass up there, okay? So I'm gonna do much the same technique with that. I'll just keep that a little bit darker because you know, the mud and the wet and that sort of stuff. Now, to actually do it, I've got my flock, and then what I've got is, I've got a mixture of PVA. Now, this is just bog standard PVA with water, mixed down to a consistency roughly 50-50, just to get it sort of nice and liquidy. I put a little bit of flow aid in there to keep it flowing, yeah, and we're gonna brush it down. Now, when we put it down, we're gonna go from roughly here all the way up to about there. Now, as we do, before we do the flocking, I've got little bits of barbed wire all around here to fit in between these gaps. I'll push those in as soon as the glue's on and then we'll move to the flocking, okay? So that's the battle plan. Let's see how it turns out, eh? Right, let's crack on. So that's our clump foliage put on. And if you look at the piece, yeah, you can see I put it in various little clumps just to break it up along with the static grass. And this sort of plainness is really breaking up now. But we've reached the stage where we need to do the final touches because we've done the gross clump foliage, i.e. the patch of the static grass and the clump foliage, yeah? But we need to start adding some little bits like this ground foliage, okay? Now this is just uh, fine chopped foam. This is gonna get sprinkled on, but there's, you can't really do it till you get to the sealing stage. The reason being is you find little bits, okay? You can't glue those down individually. Yeah, it'd just be a nightmare. So what you need to do is sort of soak the piece in your, in your sealing solution, yeah? And then drop these on and let them soak in and fix. Okay? Now, yeah, for my sealing solution, I'm using this, yeah? Now this is watered down PVA. It's one third PVA two thirds water with a little bit of Windsor Newton Flow Aid in there, okay? And it is just gonna be a simple matter of me coming along to my piece, which is down here. I've got it on a bit of plastic, yeah? Obviously there's gonna be a lot of drips. It's raised up on some foam, yeah? So that it doesn't get stuck to the plastic or whatever it's on, yeah? And it is a simple matter of starting the blasting process. And I am going to give the whole thing a good soak. Now, a lot of people pre-wet these things. There's no real need to be truthful if you've got a decent amount of flow aid. Yeah, you can just give them a soak. Concentrate at the top and let it work down. Yeah, any excess tools that I'm going to get in the craters, I can soak those up with a bit of paper. Yeah, so I'm going to crack on, get this soaked, then I'll show you the, the, the sort of foam flocking. So, all soaked, I've got my foam flock, and all I'm gonna do is just come along and give it a little bit of sprinkle in between various bits. Yeah, like I say, this will soak up while the moisture's still on it. This will soak it all up. Yeah, and fix really nice. Yeah, in between the lines. You can already see the color gradients changing on this. It's beautiful. Yeah, so sprinkle some along here. Ba 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 ba. Yeah, we'll get some dark, just a bit of a contrast. 
Yeah, dark along there. Yeah, and you can see it soaking up through the actual, all the clump foliage. Yeah, and making it nice and solid. If you are worried about some of your clump foliage not really sticking down, you can give them another blast. Now, finally, I've got my little bits of, yeah, simple, my, my just simple scatter, and I can start blending in edges. Yeah, anywhere where I think that I've, I've missed up or I've messed a little, and I haven't got it just quite right, I can go in and just fix those. Yeah, any patches where the PVA didn't stick before and I've, I've been left with empty patches, I can fix those as well. Yeah, but I can just blend these edges in. Yeah, oh, there's some. And that is all there is to it. Just need to very quickly, yeah, because we don't want to pull the PVA in there, do we? Yeah, soak that up. Ugh, I've seen the colour bleeding off it. Right, next job, I've got to leave this to drip dry, yeah, and then what you call it, obviously once it's all dry, we'll be able to do the staining, okay, and sort of make it look a little bit more realistic, yeah, so, see you shortly. So that's all our PVA sealing done, and it is all nice and dry, and we are on the last leg. So if we come down, yeah, as you can see, everything is rock solid, everything's stuck on. Yeah, it's looking a lot nicer now. The colours have blended and muted down, but it's still not quite there. You see, what the problem we've got is we've got this sort of line, and even though I broke it up with my sprinkling, it's still a little bit strong. So what I've done is I've got my airbrush and you can use a damp brush with this. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, airbrush is just a bit easier. And inside I've just got some watered down brown, my standard brown. And all I'm gonna do is just come along, yeah, and just spray along these lines. Yeah, and what that will do, Yeah, is that's going to help these lines blend in with this mud line. Now, on top of this, I've got to go round all my, all my craters, okay? And then once they're done, I'm going to come back in with a black, okay? So, well, with a black, slightly touched with my brown, yeah? Yeah, just so it's not a matte black. And I'm going to come in and do my actual, the centres of my craters, okay? So, that's my next task, yeah? Blend these edges. Do the centre of those, and then we're ready to put the watch at the resin water effects in and finish this project. So, I'll get stuck in. Back to the actual piece. Now, as you can see, yeah, I've got all my staining in. Now, not just that, it's been a, a day, yeah, and my, what you call it, my clump foliage is all firm, my, my, you know what I mean, everything is, yeah, absolutely solid and fine. And it's all sealed up, but the, that's the ground foliage. We've still got the actual trench works. And what I mean by that is, this is still, what you call it, uh, Das Modeling Putty with just paint over it. This is balsa wood with just paint over it. You know what I mean? This is cardboard with just paint over. It needs protecting. Now, I could use watered down PVA for that, but the problem with that is it can pool a bit in the recesses and on something like that, it's a little bit more difficult to get out with your paper towel. Secondly, with grass, yeah, you don't get a, a sort of glossy effect with the PVA. With, what shall it, with hard textures, such as sandbags, bunkers, stuff like that, the PVA can give it a bit of a glossy texture. Yeah, so my choice is matte varnish, okay? Now, my matte varnish of choice is this, which is Pro, S Pro XL, yeah, uh, Pro Matte Varnish. It's about nine pound a can, it's a car varnish, and it's brilliant. Dries in about an hour, yeah, it can be used in all sorts of different moistures, really tough finish on it, yeah, and very matte. So my battle plan is, I'm gonna take these out of my studio to the, the spraying area, I'm going to give them a quick spray of this, and by that I'm just going to do the sides, 
yeah and then i'm going to do the actual trench work channel yeah there's no point me really spray spraying it on the flock yeah one it's already sealed and two this is a surface varnish i.e yeah it will coat the surface of something and make it hard flock is kind of spongy and lots of different textures so it won't soak into that the pva has already done that which is why we need to use pva for that okay guys so i got some spraying to do and then we will be back with the final resin pour. So that's the matte varnishing done and it has finished lovely. But I haven't just matte varnished, I, back, I went back in with my airbrush and just sprayed a little bit more dilute brown around those craters and around those areas just to muddy it up a little bit more. Yeah, and the results are rather nice. So, that's what we're looking at. Now this has all been varnished, this is nice and tough and all playable. Same here, this is all firm. And as you can see, we've muddied it up lovely. So I've got a lovely transition from the green field all the way up to the muddy trenches. Now, we have varnished and this would typically be the end of the process. And that would be a happy chat, but we are not finished yet. You see, we have to put the resin in now for the water effects because you wanted water and puddles and you know water under the duck boards and that sort of stuff. So we've got to do that. Now, I've had to leave it to the very last stage because obviously I've sprayed these with matte varnish. If I put the resin in before the water effects, spraying them over with the matte varnish would have basically matted them out and ruined the water effects. So they've had to go in after the matte varnish. And if we come down, what I'm using is, I'm using a glass cast from Easy Composites. It's a two to one epoxy resin hot epoxy resin, yeah? And I'll be mixing in just a little bit of brown in there okay now these are my core brown colors that i've been using all the way through so it will match the ground color and it will look right okay and the idea is that we're going to pour it what do you call it in between those duck boards and there's a couple of places which you know we can put some puddles in okay but i haven't got that much of it left so my priority is do the duck boards and then depending on what how much volume of resin i've got left then we'll move on and we'll look at doing perhaps some puddles and stuff like that. I should be able to, but can't be 100% sure. Now, my next job is to mix up the resin. Now, I've talked about resins and all this sort of stuff. They're in the water playlist. Yeah, you can go and have a look at instructions on those sort of things. I'm not going to baby step you through it. But basically, I'm going to weigh them up, okay? One part, what you got, hardener, two parts, resin. I Give them a mix, okay? Th Pour them out of the cup that I'm mixing them in into a fresh cup. It's called double cupping. Yeah, and it's a good way of making sure you get a really good mix. Once the double mix is done, I'm going to throw the watch got a little bit of paint in there, get my colour in there, and get it in here as quickly as possible. That's because I've got about 15 minutes before it starts, you know, getting a bit more viscous. Okay, and it'll be difficult to pour and that sort of stuff. So I need to be on my toes on this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start my, my stirring and all that sort of stuff and just get stuck in. And when we come back, we'll have puddles in our trenches. So I'll get cracked on. We got gloss, uh, our resin everywhere and it was too wet. So what I did was came in with that really thin down base colour. Yeah, and I pretty much used all of it. Thin down, laid it over, then came along with a damp cloth and just cleaned it up. And the end results are looking something like that. Okay, which are beautiful. We've got that lovely blend between the deep pores, the sort of wet ground and that sort of... So folks, that's how I put together that awesome six foot modular trench line. Those are all the tips and tricks. Obviously, if you'd like a little bit more information because you're going to tackle this project, remember that those 5V logs on the entire process are in the projects playlist. And if you don't fancy tackling something this grand, we have got all those individual tutorials in the Let's Make playlist. Yeah, I'll throw links up to those at the end of the video. But in the meantime, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this and here are some pics of the finished piece.
If you're new to the channel, you can subscribe down there. And if you're not new, well, give the video a like. If you've got any questions, leave them in the comments for me. And as always, if you do appreciate this content, please consider pledging a dollar a month on Patreon. Keep the lights on, the cameras rolling, and me producing these awesome videos for you. And in the meantime, until next time, crack on, Terraniacs.